Thank you. I'd like to introduce the woman of the evening, our special guest tonight, former mayor of Long Beach, the Honorable Eunice Sato. Mayor Sato is a former teacher and missionary who in 1975 became the first Japanese American elected to the Long Beach City Council. She served three terms representing the 7th District, which then encompassed Cal Heights and portions of West and Central Long Beach until 1986. In 1980, she made headlines when her council colleagues elected her both Long Beach's first woman and first Asian American mayor. She has remained an active member of our community and is known for her no holes barred opinion. <laughs> Please give a big round of applause for Mayor Honorable Unisaka. Let me tell you a little bit about Eunice that you don't know. Eunice is the wife of Thomas Sato, who worked for Starkist Tuna for 28 years in procurement. She's also the mother of a daughter, Charlotte, who was Special Assistant Attorney General, State of California, and twin sons, Daniel and Douglas Sato. Daniel worked for uh, the national headquarters of Panasonic in New Jersey, and Douglas Sato is a business owner in Lakewood. So that's what you don't know about her. Let's start at the beginning. Eunice. Yes. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Eunice, where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Livingston, California. And most folks don't know anything about Livingston. It was where the last signal existed on Highway 99 in the Sunny King Valley, a small farming community, just a bend in the road. If you blink, you missed this little village that I lived in. I went to grammar school, high school uh, in Livingston, and I went to Modesto Junior College for two years, and then after that, went to San Jose State College. But that was right before the war. I had enrolled in September, and in March, I suddenly had to come home because Pearl Harbor was December 7th. And there were a lot of questions about what was going on in the country. And um, the president at that time, Roosevelt, decided that all persons of Japanese ancestry, uh, first generation, second generation, didn't matter if you were Japanese of any sort, we were all told that we would have to be leaving California. Well, I just went two quarters in March, and I heard rumors, so I had taken my exams early, so that was over. But at Friday night, there were several of us from the same hometown, and we had to uh, take the uh, bus home to Livingston from San Jose. And then the next day, my mother asked three of us children, there were six of us, the three younger ones that were still home. She asked us, well, do you want to go to camp or do you want to leave? And then my brother, two of my brothers and myself said, we want to leave. There wasn't any question about it. And so my mother listened to the children and decided to leave. But that was Saturday noon. By Sunday noon, the next day, we had to leave to be out of California by midnight that night. So we had to clear out everything within 24 hours. And so by Sunday noon, we had a little two-wheel trailer with our bedding and our kitchen uh, equipment and our clothes, and we took off. And it was in March, and at midnight, we were in snow-covered mountains. And I remember that so clearly as if it was last night. It was all still. Not a mouse was stirring. It was all white, moonlight, nobody was around. It was the most emptiest feeling I felt that I still sense it today. It was really worried because we had to clean out our home and just overnight. We didn't know whether we were going to go back ever see our home again. And we're going somewhere that we had never been. I think it was kind of daring 
for us to take up my mother, father, my two brothers, myself, in a Pontiac, an old one beside. But the, the thing is, we had problems in the, in the mountains. We had problems in the mountains. Um, the trailer stopped swerving. It's just an old two-wheel two trailer. And so we had to stop in the mountains and, you know, I, I didn't do anything. I just sat in the car. My two brothers did whatever they had to do. But we finally got to Colorado where my oldest sister, brother-in-law, lived. My sister uh, married a, a Colorado boy and her, uh, the brother of uh, her husband lived in Colorado and told them that uh, they could go over and stay with them. And my sister and her husband stopped by our house on their way and they said, well, if you folks want to come, you can come. So we left. So we did have a destination of a sort. Um, we all had to sleep on the floor when we got there, but we were thankful that we had a place to stay. But for the next day, we had to find a place to stay. And then my uh, two brothers and my father had to find some work. We were totally on our own. Eunice? Yes. Did your brothers um, ever fight in the war? Oh, yes. My oldest brother, bless him, he was a patriot from, patriot from day one. And he volunteered the day after Pearl Harbor. That was the kind of person he was. Fantastic. And he did well. He uh, had the Infantry Combat um, uh, Award and he had several badges. And I was very proud of him and we were very close. I'll tell you, we were both Republicans and we kind of believed in the same things. And although there were six of us, the two of us were the closest. He uh, fought in Africa and Italy and France and Germany. Wow. As did my youngest brother, the same theater. Although he did volunteer, but had to go after we moved to Colorado. And you know, my other brother had uh, physical hearing problems, so he wasn't taken. You know, Eunice, I'm surprised you didn't fight in the war. <laughs> and you know what? Tell me about what you wanted to be when you were growing up. What did you want to be? I wanted to be a nurse. And you know, I was short from day one. And I was, too, I was told that I was too short to be a nurse. I just, you know, have to be able to reach over the bed and make nurses and all kinds of, and I was all disappointed. But you know what? I was short from the beginning. I, I'm a failed kindergarten. <laughs> One year because I wasn't big enough, you know, to be in the kindergarten. But um, okay. some wiser people took care of that and said, "No, she can go back to the first grade." Thank heavens, I'd be still in grade school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Eunice. Describe your, describe your educational path and where it led you professionally in your life uh, prior to political office. Tell me the four things perhaps that you were. I understand that uh, you were a teacher, a missionary, a mother, and then a politician. You want to tell me about those? Yes, I received my degree and my teaching certificate in Greeley, uh, University of Northern California, and Northern California, and Northern Colorado. And then I went to Michigan to the Upper Peninsula to an old iron ore mining town and taught three years there. And there were a lot of Polish people there, Polish village, and they had never seen an Oriental, so I was really a showpiece. <laughs> <laughs> a short showpiece. <laughs> and I loved their um, pasties. You know, wood dough and potato and beef. Oh. Oh, they were delicious. I just remember that more than anything else. <laughs> and you know, it was, I got like a missionary when I went to Alpha, Michigan, because there was just one gasoline station. No grocery store, no library, no theater, nothing. Just one gas station, which sold, you know, snacks. And so there wasn't anything for me to do. So what I did was, in the wintertime, I went for a walk in the snow, and I enjoyed it. I was young then, and it was a dry snow. So that was my entertainment, going for a walk in the snow. I really enjoyed that. And then there was a piano in the church, so I went up to the church and fiddled on the piano. I never took a lesson, but I could at least play a hymn, so I enjoyed doing that. So anyway, those were three years, and I thought, well, 
the first three years you've got to go or you, you know, they'll take you. You can't be choosing. So I thought, well, three years, it's time to move. So I met and um, from Michigan, I went to Washington because my mother and father were staying with my next sister who was married. My parents kind of followed her around. Uh, my sister's uh, husband was a Presbyterian pastor, but he, uh, with the evacuation, he uh, became a Japanese language instructor because he was Japanese. He came here as a Japanese to go to the School of Theology and, and take an assignment in Washington. In fact, he was in Tule Lake in Washington, you know, and because he was a pastor, and there were some unhappy young people in the camp, the young men, and they just thought, you know, why should we go to camp? We didn't do anything wrong, and, and we were being rebellious. And my brother-in-law tried to uh, <laughs> advise them to not be radical, but just make up your own individual mind and just take your individual action, whether don't join a gang. Well, he was beat up, and because he was beat up, he was allowed to leave to the way. And because he did not resist, he was really not hurt. He just let them do what they wanted to. So anyway, I like to talk about this brother-in-law because he was brother-in-law, my sister's husband, and he uh, became the head of the Oriental Division of the Library of Congress until he retired there after some twenty years. Fantastic. And he even went to Japan to kind of teach them what they do at the Library of Congress, you know. And my sister was able to go a couple of years while he was there. So I'm proud of him because I want to mention this now. I mean, I had a chance to. He received the uh, honor from the Japanese government. And I received the same honor from the Japanese government after I met the city council. It was in 1996. It was called the, the, the treasure and the five gold rosettes. And only very special people receive it. And I was very happy that I received it. And it was unexpected. I didn't even know it existed. But I think it's because of my role on the city council and as mayor. You know, when I became mayor, Wonderful. Kojima, Kojima Construction Company became okay. aware. And they invested in the the uh, World Trade Center, uh -huh. the Hilton Hotel uh -huh. over there. Uh, the Japanese company uh, invested in the Sheraton Hotel. They built that. Um, they in, uh, purchased other, but those were the two main ones, the World Trade Center and the um, Sheraton. Sheraton. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little later because actually, you were responsible in many ways for leading the charge to develop the Hyatt, the Hilton, and the Renaissance Hotel in Long right, Beach. I think I'm kind of skipping around. I was supposed to tell you about my life travels. After I went to Washington, I was going to teach there, found out it was a segregated school. I wasn't going to have any part to do with a segregated school, so I decided to move. I went to New York to Columbia University and Teachers College, got my master's, and then I was going to go find another job in a public school. But my brother-in-law's pastor friend, another pastor, said they're looking for a missionary to go to Japan. He said, would you like to go? I thought, well, never entered my mind, <laughs> but I went to, got my college degree and had three years experience. And, I'm single, I'm not go. Uh-huh. So I went, very <laughs> unexpectedly. And I was very fortunate to be able to be a teacher in the oldest mission school in Japan. It's well known, and it was a school for like doctors and professors, the high income level families. And so it was a very distinguished girls' school, junior high and senior high. And I was able to teach there, and that was in 1948, three years after the end of the war, and Japan was very good and torn down and nothing there. And they were so grateful when I went, and I realized later why they were so grateful, because it was barren. People were having a hard time finding things to eat, 
and I had taken a ton of shortening sugar and, and uh, flour for my basic ingredients for baking. You were rich. Yeah, was rich. <laughs> right. And I think they were really very happy to learn to make these uh, biscuits and pies and cakes and cream puffs and everything else. And, and, and not only learn to make them, but even <coughs> make everybody else would have paid the gold mine to you know, purchase something. So um, I, I say this because it's been such an important part of my life. Those students of 50 years ago are still friends of mine. In fact, yesterday, one of them sent me a birthday present. After 50 years of wow. being a student, I Woo. That's wonderful. Thank you, Willis. Thank you. Wow. So I went to Japan and was did three years of teaching there, but I married there and had three children, a daughter and twin boys. And when my daughter was five years old, I told my husband, it's time for us to go back to the United States. I want my kids to go to school here. So we left. And my husband uh, got the job at Starkus because he was in a tuna business anyway. Thank you. So I came and became a mother. And when you're a mother, the first thing you do is become a PTA. Absolutely. That's how you got involved in the community, That's through the PTA, I, right? Right. I went to John Muir, uh, Stevens Junior, Holly High, and then I became the council president, PTA council president, and the president of the Council of Churches with about 50 church members. And, you know, at, at 72 to 74, those two organizations, I was president. And I thought, well, I came to the end of the year and I said, well, it's time to retire. I, I did my job as a law <laughs> I don't think so. Then, I don't think so. Then there was a vacancy in the 7th district because that council person had to resign because of illegal activities. It's so good and perjury. <laughs> So there was a quick resignation, and that created a vacancy, and nobody was you know, prepared to run a campaign, but they had to have someone. And that someone was uh, from the school district who approached me and wondered if I would run for city council. And you know what, Eunice, you had a lot of friends. You had to have a lot of friends because you didn't raise much money. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that. How, how, what did you do? Okay, you had a lot of friends. Okay, so you didn't raise much money, so how did you get over? Did you become an instant financial manager? I think so. <laughs> Tell us about that. You, you learn to do a lot with a little. And I didn't bring my first flyer. It was like this. It was like a piece of blue paper and just copied. It wasn't anything fancy. Nothing. Didn't expensive. need to be. Just to get the message. And I had some flyers and a black and white poster, and that was about it. And I walked. I walked the neighborhood. And I had a lot of PT friends, church friends, and I was involved in other community organizations, like the Red Cross, or the Safety Council, the Coordinating Council, mm -hmm. various organizations. So people knew me. I wasn't a stranger. Wonderful. And they were all over the city, and the voters were just in the 7th District, but I had the support. And I'm, I'm glad that I, I said yes because my husband was in New Guinea or somewhere as far away as you can get him. <laughs> I placed a phone call and I didn't reach him the next day. He returned the call, I guess, and I wasn't home, so he had to call again. But he reached me and he said, well, what happened? I said, well, they want me to run for city council. Is it okay if I do that? And he said, well, if you want to. So I said, okay. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you. You know, um, that's often the way that it is. Uh, I think it happened to me the same way. And of course, I asked my husband, and he said the same thing, because he knew we would anyway. <laughs> Thank you, dear husband. <laughs> okay. In 1980, when you were elected mayor, what did you feel was the most pressing issue in the city at that time? It was a pressing issue for everyone. If you remember, uh, well, 
when I was mayor, but I came on the city council in 75. Okay. And it took a while to get to know what was going on. But you know, by, by 1980, if you remember, if you lived in Long Beach, there were drunks, prostitutes, closed down stores, dirty sidewalks. It was the dumps. I'm sorry, it was the worst as any city can be. Something had to be done very quickly. And we were fortunate to be able to hire a good city manager. And I said, good. We interviewed him. I voted for him. We selected him. And that was John Deaver. And I say he's good because he, 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 he took, turned up later on as the uh, president of the whole city managers association of the whole country. So, you know, he had to be good. And I know after he left, he went to uh, Europe as a consultant after the end of the war. You know, these new beginning countries had to know how to start government, so he went there. So we had a good city manager. And, you know, we weren't, we weren't really, the city council wasn't aggressive as far as our own agendas. We listened to the professional city manager. He made proposals, and we agreed that his uh, plan was a good one. And that was, it's a dead city, and the downtown is the heart of the city. And if our heart is weak, you know, we're not able to do anything. So you have to have a strong heart. So we put all the money in downtown, whether it was state monies or federal monies or special funds. We Close on downtown. And that was to get the confidence of the private sector. It was a, no one would have invested in the city that in the shape it was. So we had to give the private sector the message that the city was serious about turning the city around. And so we decided that we should build a mall on Long Beach Boulevard in 56. And Ernie Hahn from uh, San Diego took us up on it. We built them all. And that was the first signal that we gave to the private sector that we meant business. We're going to turn the city around. And that was called the second win. And we had a marathon race. And I had to get in shirts and tennis shoes and run with the wrist. It was the second win. And it attracted attention. And then after that, the first development was the Hyatt Regency. After we did that, we got attention from patients. We went to the Hyatt Regency. We had to give certain considerations as a first uh, business to come in and invest. But the Hyatt Regency is a beautiful hotel. They did a good job. They're, they're still first class. It's a diamond for downtown. When I was mayor at that time, I remember the, the ground breaking, the ribbon cutting, and all that. Then after the Hyatt, you know, the private sector, the businesses, but hey, this city really needs to turn around. So we got the Sheraton, we got the Renaissance, we got the double Arthur Towers. The Hilton. And the Hilton, and the World Trade Center. Yes. And it was one after another. And that gave the message. And that's what we needed to do to turn the city around. The government can't spend money trying to do You have to have a private sector bring in business. And I think we were very, very successful. So successful that you can look at downtown today that would never be there if we didn't do what we did. We thank you for that. We thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. I also want to ask you what your take was and what your position is on Prop 13. Was it necessary? Did it help? Did it help? Who did it help? Did it help old people, young people, or all people? Prop 13 came up because the property taxes were going up and up, and the senior citizens weren't able to pay that tax. We couldn't have senior citizens all losing their homes. And that was the reason why I was for it, and I think most people were. But the quirk was somehow the businesses got that too. Yes, they did. It was, meant, it was supposed to save the senior citizens, but the businesses got the benefit. 
and maybe that kind of started the whole problem about finances at the county and state level, you know, the monies were taken away. So Proposition 13 had a purpose, and people are still kind of supporting that because homes are the most precious thing that people, persons have. So it was very necessary, yeah. and it still is. Homes, yeah, yes. everybody needs home, no matter what area you're living, you need home. And so it was important. It was, it was a, it, it made it difficult for us to do business in the city, but it had to be done to protect the senior citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Eunice. You know, I know you probably experienced a degree of controversy when you were mayor. How did you feel you got along with the other council uh, persons, and how did you respond to any criticism, if you had any? Well, I think uh, my colleagues sort of knew who I was. And I just held my own, my own positions. And you still do. And I, when, I, when, I, when I ran, I didn't promise anything to the people, to the voters of the Senate District. I promised integrity. That's all I promised. And I figured I delivered that. And I am proud and I feel comfortable with my accomplishment of maintaining my integrity. Thank you, Eunice. You know, historically, the Long Beach papers have been major players in city politics. How did you get along with the Press Telegram and any other papers? And did you view the effects of uh, the press influence and coverage negatively or positively? Well, I know the Press Telegram was writing all kinds of articles, but then you, you really can't pay attention. You, you, you can't be thrown off guard. You have to maintain what you're trying to do, what you're trying to accomplish. And if you get bothered about this or about that, criticism or that, you're not going to get anywhere. You're going to be, be knocking around and not accomplish your goal. So uh, you can't completely ignore it, but you don't let it affect you in your, in your work for the city. For the if I remember correctly, Eunice, the first time you ran, it was citywide, was it not? Mm -hmm. And what year was that? 1975. I was uh, nominated or elected by the 7th District, and the two vote, two of the highest vote that it, uh, ran citywide. And I think that that's the first time it happened. If I remember correctly, too, you ran against 20 other people. There were 20. Can you imagine that? <laughs> there were all kinds of people. There were city, other city leaders. If I mention names, you will never who they are. 20. And there were trade, uh, trade heads, you know, captains, and all kinds of people ran. And you beat them all. I did. Hello. I love it. I love it. I love it. Altogether, you were down there 11 and a half years, but I just wanted people to know that there were 20 people running, and Eunice came out ahead, of course. Of course. Eunice, did you feel access to parks and libraries were sufficient when you, during your, your tenure as mayor? And were there any experiences dealing with these issues that uh, came up that you remember? Well, you know, Long Beach is very fortunate to have branch libraries. Not many cities have that. And we did, and, we, and they were there when I was in, uh, uh, on the city council. Um, and I think the parks, they don't have, they didn't have the trouble that we have now with finances. So there are all kinds of things. Even in the seventh district, we had a swimming pool, and some young people, you know, kind of destroyed the place, but they kept on repairing it, repairing it, and spending money, you know, because they knew it was necessary to have facilities. And, and you know, thinking of prop. Thinking about what you just said, when you ran and you won, what did you consider the most important thing uh, in your district? I'd be happy to answer that. I spent a lot of time, my energy, um, and trying to uh, promote property maintenance. Property maintenance. I figured that's something that everybody can do without really costing the city a lot of money or any money. Just everyone keeping up their property, getting the cars off of the front lawn, the junk out of the front yard. Thank you. Having the lawns <laughs> cut. Thank you. And, and maintaining your property. And that raises your property value, create a, a raise the value of the whole neighborhood. And my intent was to raise the uh, neighborhood value 
because I was living there, I didn't want to go down and down, I wanted to go up. up. And so I told the city staff people, if they're going to put any building in, any homes, I said, they've got to be as good or better, not anything worse. And no, I don't think people know, because it happened on the west side, and I don't do things for publicity, I just do it. Had 100 new homes, three, four, five bedrooms home in the former Navy housing property. The Navy let us have the land, and there are 100 new homes, three, four, five bedrooms, big homes, not little huts. And people, it went overnight. And it was the Filipinos who had money. They come here and work and they save money. And they bought all those homes. They were gone overnight. Wow. So you can see how badly they were needed. It really started. And there are other smaller uh, housing developments that I had put in. And whenever there was any repair, I just said, you just have to make it better, not just maintain the standard that they had before. Thank you so much, Eunice. I wonder if any of you know what the word Sato means. It's not sour, but it's, there you go. The word sato means sweet. Is she not sweet? Sato is sugar. That development is called sugar coal. Never, nobody ever told me why the developer called it sugar coal, but I had my own opinion. <laughs> Absolutely. Eunice, we had white flight, we had yellow flight. The Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese, the Caucasians. Where did they go? The Japanese Americans uh, all fled to Orange County. Okay, can't hear you. They all went to Orange County. They, they lived almost en masse. There are a lot more Japanese Americans, very few, very few left. And I guess it was the uh, influx of the demographics, the change. Could very well have been, I yes. I think that's what it was because there wasn't a war going on or anything. So I think that's why they left. And most of them left, but you know, I couldn't leave. We couldn't leave because I was a councilman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> We finally moved in 1990. I left the council in 86, so we stayed four years. A, a, a Caucasian lady, a widow, a widow, lady widow, was shot and killed in her backyard on a Saturday between 7 and 10 a.m. How can you ever feel safe in a place like that? And that's when my children said, Mom and Dad, you gotta move, you gotta move. But, you know, that's easier said than done. The thing is, we moved from my son went house hunting by himself for us. Wow. And he found this place in Bixley Village. And he took us there and showed us the house he thought we might like. I didn't like it. But the, the realtor said, well, there's another house on sale. And she showed us that. And that one was like a bar. It was dark. And the lights at the bottom of the sofa. It was horrible. <laughs> but another one was just what I liked. And we just chose it right there and then. And you still live there? And still live there, and we're very happy. If you want to live somewhere real nice and long, which live in Bixby Village because it's quiet and safe. Shame on you. <laughs> Shame on you, Eunice. Anybody can live in there. You just go up and down here on the matter where you want. City started having uh, district elections, and uh, I asked Eunice. Those first uh, district elections, what did she consider them to be? And Eunice, your answer was? Nine kingdoms. <laughs> Nine kingdoms. She said each district declared itself a kingdom. So I guess we still to this day have nine kingdoms. That's probably a very good definition, don't you think? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'd also like to ask you uh, how you feel about the city spending money on, to support large-scale events and festivals like the Grand Prix and the Sea Festival, and uh, do you think it brought anything, uh, notoriety or money, or what did it do for the city? Can you tell me that? I think it has brought a lot of outside interest. In fact, one of the 
best thing that I did when I joined the city council in 75. I was just new, didn't know anything, but Chris Poop came before the city council and asked if he could bring in the Grand Prix. That was a first major vote, and I voted yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And you've been voting yes for that kind of thing ever since. So the Grand Prix came in, the Sea Festival came in, and we have been doing quite well with those things. Yes. I also like to ask you, um, while you were in office, were there any proposals for low-income housing, and what was your position on those? When I was chair of the Housing Authority, and the Housing Authority worked in that area, so I know that there was Section 8 mm -hmm. housing for uh, low-income seniors. Yes. And uh, during my time, I don't know where they got the money, maybe from the county, but the Carmelitas housing neighborhood, that whole facility was upgraded. And there were other things. So we were concerned way back then about having decent housing for as many people as possible in our city. Thank you. Were you ever involved or did you... Um Get involved in Neighborhood Watch? Did I get involved? It started in the 7th District. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, I'm afraid it did. It, it, it really did, and it's a good thing, and it's still going. I live in Dixon Village, and they're revitalizing that Neighborhood Watch because, it, you know, police are expected to do all kinds of things, but we, they can't do it all. We as individuals can do a lot to protect ourselves and our property. So it's up to us to do our little bit, and we can be assisting in a great way. You know, so little things that add up that change the whole scene. Thank you, Eunice. Eunice, how did you feel about uh, Senator Sam Hayakawa's campaign to make English the official national language in the, in the early 1980s? Was he ahead of his time? I think, I was just gonna say, yeah, I think he was ahead of his time. Uh, I get uh, mail all the time about promoting English as the language of the country, and I still believe that very strongly. If there's anything that's going to hold us all together, it's the English language. If you would better get rid of that, what's going to be the common bounds? No rope, nothing to hang on to. We must teach English as a, or get people teach, learn, whatever, educate them. That English language must be the official language. Just think about the money all the government material printed in so many different languages, that's a lot of money. Yes. It's waste of money. Yes. We can't afford that kind of waste. So we better start thinking and make some changes if we can. And all of you out there, help make it happen. Well, <laughs> Eunice, I know that you very much involved in your church. I remember that... Uh, you were involved with the United Methodist Church for maybe 84 years, 84 years, and now you're involved with uh, another church as well, and that's the First Presbyterian Church. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's the Grace First Presbyterian Church. Thank you. Presbyterian Church. The First Presbyterian Church was in Lakewood. It was mostly Caucasian, some mix, but mostly Caucasian. The Grace Church was mostly Japanese Americans, although there were other Spanish and other different uh, ethnicities. And uh, Grace um, was downtown on Locust, like 13th or 14th downtown, mm -hmm. and they were being robbed to the bottom of the, they were seeing their <clears throat> communion things and anything of value, they was just raided and they just had to leave that place. So they moved to Paramount and it wasn't the best of places, but that was the place they found and then they had to leave there and they were looking for property and, um, First, First Presbyterian at Lakewood and Los Coyotes students. Is that Studebaker? Studebaker. Near Carson. They uh, said, well, come in, you know, use our property until you find me. Well, the two pastors got along well and they talked things over and I guess they really were serious and uh, the congregation was approached and they very carefully very carefully. They didn't want to impose it upon the congregation, but wanted to have a congregation feel comfortable in joining the two churches. And they took a number of years. It was very studied and well um, considered about all the ramifications. They didn't want unhappiness 
you know, because it's two groups, two different churches combining. But it was a wonderful decision. It's helped the church. The two churches are much stronger for what they are having joy. And let me tell you, Doris, I was involved. There's Tom Tim Jackford over there. He was head of the committee and was part of this committee. There were a, a, around the table about ten of us. We met every Wednesday night for a whole year. That's how carefully we met to raise a million dollars for the Katrina victims. Wow. Just our church, a million dollars. We met every <laughs> That's some serious outreach. And, and, and I want to add to that because it's very important. We didn't just raise the money and give them the money. We held on to the money. We're still raising them. It was a five-year project, and we are funding them as a need. It's fun, and our church groups have been going, you know, regularly every month or so. A different group goes to know what's happening so that everyone gets educated firsthand as to what we're doing. And the best thing we did was to buy a house a two-story house that was stable and this is a, like a dormitory. It had kitchens and laundry facilities and, and people from all over the country are volunteering to go to Louisiana, Mississippi to help the Katrina victims and they are staying in our house that we are providing them. It's not the Ronald McDonald house, it's the, <laughs> the church house. Pardon me? The Grace House, that's wonderful. Because our church is Grace Presbyterian. Absolutely, that's wonderful. So it's serving a wonderful purpose for all the helpers. You know, they all have to find a place to stay when they volunteer. It's so much simpler and it costs hardly anything. You just do your own cooking and, you know, do your own housekeeping, which is like being at home. So I, I think we've been a blessing to many people, the victims and the helpers. I think we're doing a good job. Thank you, Eunice. Thank you very, very much. Can you tell me what you remember as being one of the most surprising or funniest experiences you ever had while you were mayor? Or maybe it's one and the same. Well, <laughs> well I, I don't know if there's anything funny, uh, but you know, what's been surprising for me from the standpoint from where I am now, I'm just amazed at the number of wonderful people in our city. So many of you here are in this room. You're my friends, I see you all over. You're just wonderful, caring people. A city can't have more than we have of wonderful citizens who care about one another. And that's why I'm part of Grace First Presbyterian. We really care about people. The young ones, the old ones, the challenged ones, Whatever, whatever their need, we're out there to fill that. And whether it's in the city or in the state or the country or wherever. And that's what religion is all about, trying to help those who need help. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Absolutely. What would be your advice to people now at these challenging times to uh, help, uh, help themselves in, uh, in, the, in this city? How to help? In yourselves and your neighbors? Yeah, well, what, what, would you, what would be your advice? Well, it's up to you to use your good little brain because you know what you are able to do, your talents, your skills, uh, what your interest is. Uh, you can't do all of it, so you would pick an arena, a job that you feel you can do and do it well and be helpful. We, we wouldn't all be volunteering for the same thing. There's lots to volunteer for. Lots. I don't see how people can stay home and play cards. There's so much to work to do. You know, I, I agree with you, Eunice. You know, when people tell me they're tired, and I say, who has time to be tired? I mean, you know, if you're going to sit home and watch television, of course you're going to be tired. And I'm not saying not do that, but, you know, there's too many other things out here to be done than to just sit at home and whine and, and talk about being tired. And as she stated, pick an area that you are proficient at. Offer and share your knowledge. Then get busy and get it done. It's a little something, but every morning I go for a walk and I pick up the newspaper from the sidewalk, take it up to the porch, to the front door for a lady 
an elderly lady. Yeah, I think she appreciates my picking up the paper from the from the sidewalk up to her front door. That's nothing, but it's healthy. That's a random act of kindness every day. That's what that is, a random act of kindness every day. Thank you. Hi, Thank I'm you. My most recent involvement, I've joined the Salvation Army uh, Advisory Board, and I've been was asked to part, be part of the steering committee for raising money for the uh, Croc Community Center that the Salvation Army is going to build. And we are fortunate, very fortunate in Long Beach, because there, there are many Salvation Armies in the country, or in, even on the western coast, and Long Beach was lucky enough to get this grant of $80 million as the very core of this project. But the 6th District? In the 6th District, over on, on PCH, That's on right. PCH uh, east of Walnut. Right. It's right next to the City College. Yeah. Just <laughs> the The Dust Bowl. It's the most <laughs> wonderful project that Long Beach will ever have, I guarantee. But who, because who else would be willing to drop $80 million for you to do something? That I, doesn't happen every day, every year, every century. And it's going to be a, a world-class structure that's going to be well-maintained. That's why we're having to raise locally $25 million because we can't have just receive a gift. You never do that, right? Right, you have when to. get something, you've got to give a part of it yourself. So we're working very hard to raise uh, $25 million. And we're pretty much there. But, you know, these are hard economic times, and people ordinarily may be able to do it, but not now. But, you know, I went to the port to a shipper. And, and the, you know, the shipping business has been pretty good, but everybody's down. But I went to the shipper and told him, You've been always generous and good and giving back to the community. You're a good corporate citizen when you give. And they, they couldn't give as much as we wanted or as much as they wanted, but they were made a pledge for five years. And that's what you do. You just go out and ask because there's no other project that would live as long. It would live longer than the city. I mean, the city hall talks about tearing down the city hall and tearing down the library. Well, this will never be torn down. It will be there because it will have the funds to maintain it and staff it and, and keep it first class throughout the years of this life. Thank you. Yes, Claudette. The question is, Eunice, when I look at you, I see kindness and sweetness. Tell me about your children and your grandchildren. I have a daughter, Charlotte, and as, as uh, Doris has said, she was Special Assistant Attorney General when Dan Rundgren was the Attorney General of the California. And she's uh, retired now, but my husband is in the assistant facility, so she comes down every month to see him because she's not employed. She comes and sees her. Her father, father. wonderful. Yeah. And then I have twin boys, Doug and, uh, Doug and Daniel. Doug is named Doug because my husband thought so highly of Douglas MacArthur. Yep, uh -huh. Douglas MacArthur. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Douglas is following his father's footsteps of selling fishing material. He was selling boats and he was selling other things, maritime stuff. My son, Daniel in New Jersey was in the um, regional headquarters in Cyprus for Panasonic. Hmm. Then he moved on to New Jersey for the national headquarters. And he's worked them for all these years. But you know, they've had many <laughs> high risks let go. But this time, Panasonic let go 15,000 people oh. throughout the country. Setbacks. And he didn't survive that, so he, he's lost his job after working all the time. But, you know, that's life. I tell everybody else is losing jobs, so you just have to go out and look for your jobs. So, I said, put out as many fishing lines as you can. <laughs> <laughs> it will get better. We, we guarantee it. Come on. Come on, all you nosy people. Yes. Dorothy Kistler. Hi, Dorothy. And uh, a friend of Eunice's, however, but I 
I would like to know from Eunice, uh, what was the most impressive dignitary or celebrity or someone that you met when you were mayor? Well, I would say the Empress of Japan hmm. met her at the uh, Consul General's residence in LA and I struck up a conversation with her because I was teaching in this very famous girls' school in Japan, and she was aware of the school, and so we had a common subject, so we kept talking, and then the LA photographer took a picture of us, and it came out in the LA Times, and I asked them for copies, so that's my favorite picture. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Did you have a question? Yes. Do you heard that question? Did you hear it? Okay. I guess it's because of my mother. My mother was, uh, you know, born in 18, late 1800s. Anyway, she was a very educated woman for her time. She was brilliant. But she was the oldest of the family. There were other brothers and sisters, but she was the oldest. And her father was in the silk business. And silk business? Uh, Silkworms. Silkworms. He, he, he was growing silkworms for the silk. And for some reason, the mulberry trees died one year. There was no food for the silkworms. And so he sort of went bankrupt. And my mother, being the oldest, even though she was female, she, she volunteered to come to the United States to try to earn some money to send back to help the family. Well, it turned out she never was able to go back to Japan, except when my husband and I called her when our twins were born, and we made the excuse that we need help for the twins, so please come. That, that was the only reason she would be willing to come, and she did. But you know, it was funny, when we were leaving Japan, she was supposed to help me with my nine-month-old twins, and she, they wouldn't let her board the plane. Why? And so I thought, well, am I going to stay back with my mother, or go ahead with my twins? And they were on formula, you know, what would I do with two infants if I stayed over? No place to stay, no place to fix their formula. So I just decided to go home myself, and my mother came a couple of days later. But um, I just feel that she had such a hard life, and she had potentials of being a great woman who could accomplish a lot and serve humanity. And it was my sorrow for her life, the way it ended, that I feel. I gotta kinda do it for her. I think, I mean, that's in my mind all the time. And it has to come from somewhere, and I think that's where I just feel she would have been a tremendous, successful woman. But because she sacrificed to help her family, she came to California and you know, ended in the farm and the depression and the war, and nothing worked out right. And she just sort of ended up ended life, and I just felt so sorry. I thought, I'm doing this for her. I think that's my answer. Thank you, Eunice. You know, the first time I um, went to Japan, I believe it was in 1980 or 1982, and I have been um, to all the continents except Antarctica in my lifetime, and I went on my own dime, not the port's dime. But the first time I went, uh, the uh, the travel agent told me to take a gift because I wanted to spend a one or two days with a family. So they told me to take 12 oranges and three ribeye steaks. And I'm thinking, this is a gift? Well, I did what I was told, checked into the hotel, and two days later, my, uh, the people that I was going to stay with came to pick me up. So I took my 12 oranges in a little crate uh, from you know, the, the kind you can get in a fruit store. <clears throat> and I took the, the three ribeye steaks in a, in a coal pack. And when you're in Japan, there's very little space. So, of course, whatever was behind that, that frame in, in, in a room was your space. Whatever was behind that screen is your space. So the, the morning that we got up to cook, 
uh, we had the sterno, and uh, then we went out to shop. And you have to shop every day because there was no refrigeration. And I believe that was in 1982. So when I went out into the streets, one American orange was $20. Wow. And one ribeye steak was 70 American dollars. So I had taken them a wonderful gift <laughs> and did not know it. But that's the kind of thing you learn when you go to foreign countries and you experience the, the, the way that people actually live. Uh, you can be there for years and don't even go, you don't, you don't go to your relatives' homes because there's no place for you to entertain. So you learn a great deal by traveling and by getting involved with the, uh, with the, uh, the people that you live with. So thereafter, every time I'd go to Japan, I'd have those oranges <laughs> and those three ribeye steaks, and it was a great experience. Isn't that right, Dr. Mike? That's right. <laughs> okay, yes. Diane. 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 Mitch. Eunice, what was the hardest decision you had to vote on when you were on council, and why was it hard? What was the most difficult? Yes. Speak up, Eunice. Speak up. The most difficult. Um, not so much the decision, but having the council come to a decision. How's that? Are they, are they an issue? Well, for you, yeah. um, I know elected officials have to struggle with looking at this side of the issue and that side of the issue, and there's a lot of mental pulling. Well, I can think of one issue, which was an appointment to a civil service commission. I was mm -hmm. a mayor, and I was supposed to fill that vacancy. And my idea, Filling that vacancy on the Civil Service Commission was to get a person who had experience as an employer, also had experience as an employee. Good. The two different types. And that was my criteria I had in my mind, and that was it. I wasn't going to go for some friends or somebody that you wanted to promote, but the council members would not go along with the person. I had found the person that fit my criteria. And so I was trying to get that person appointed, but the council didn't see it. Like they just wanted to get their friend in, their acquaintance or whatever, or some other representation. But I thought you know, some other representation, whether it's a woman or, or, you know, or the age or whatever, but I thought the criteria should be having experience in those two phases of employee or employee. And so that was a very difficult situation. Um, it turned out differently. Yeah, that the person I had in mind. I see I had there were a lot of applicants and I called them all in and I interviewed them. So I knew what I was doing, just meeting them personally. And so I stuck by my guns. But I did not get my way. But that's all right. I tried my best. And what can you do? I would like to thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, units. Let's stand up. Come on. Thank you, units. Thank you.